Huh. Watching Kyle's unboxing videos again? Yeah, he always finds the coolest... No way! A robot dog? Gotta ask where he got it. Or use your Samsung Galaxy S24 Ultra. Just draw a circle around the dog on your screen, and it shows you where to buy it right in the app. Oh, I just learned a new trick. And that for once, I beat Kyle to the next big thing. Circle it, find it, with the new Galaxy S24 Ultra, and circle the search with Google. Get yours now at Samsung.com. Internet connection required. Results may vary based on visuals. Hello, Duke fans, and welcome to episode 339 of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. It is Monday, September 6th, 2021. It is Labor Day here in the United States, and in a few short hours, it will also be the first night of Rosh Hashanah for those who are observing. I am your host, Sam Klein. I am coming to you from my girlfriend's parents' house, where we will be having Rosh Hashanah dinner in just a few hours. I am joined, as always, by Jason Evans and Donald Wine. Donald, I'll start with you first. You are somewhere interesting that is not home today. Where is that, and why don't you sound like yourself? Well, I don't sound like myself because soccer is back. Uh, We are in the middle of World Cup qualifying. It has just begun for the U.S. men's national team, and I am in the midst of a I finished two of the three matches. I was in El Salvador on Thursday for that game. I'm currently here in Nashville, Tennessee, where the U.S. played Canada last night and am off to Honduras tomorrow for the final game of this window. Um, It's a lot of fun. It's very tiring, as you could probably hear from my voice, uh, but it has been a fun time down here in Nashville. We had over 40,000 people at the game. Our group that I help run had about 3,000, so Uh, It was a nice little uh, mini reunion, so to speak, when it comes to the game. Excellent. And Jason Evans is also here. Jason, what is for dinner tonight? Oh, wow. I haven't even thought about it. I'm going to my mom's. I I, I don't know what we're doing for dinner tonight. You're not in charge. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not in charge, right. I actually do a ton of cooking in my family. Like One of the things about COVID is, for some reason, I've become uh, the the family chef, uh, but I'm not cooking tonight. By the way, Happy New Year to you, Sam. Thank you. You too. You too. All right. Thank you to you both. Thank you. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, appreciate all of you out there and hope everybody, even if you're not uh, celebrating the Jewish New Year, that you're at least having a, a long weekend and getting to enjoy Labor Day. And and by the way, let me jump in and, and say to folks, you know, you should probably be paying attention to Donald's soccer podcast. This is the time to be paying attention. Donald, I'm going to I'm going to pimp out your soccer podcast for you because uh, it's it's an exciting time for the U.S. men's national team although the results have not been what we had hoped so far. Yeah, well, it, it's been, it'll be a lot to talk about when I get home this week and record uh, for both Stars and Stripes FC and also the World of CONCACAF podcast. Um, but if you guys, in the meantime, just a little side plug, if you are familiar with the writer Grant Wall, I happened to be on his podcast earlier or late last week, uh, so you should check that out as well. Excellent, excellent. All right. We have enough. I think that's enough about soccer for this show. Although I'm sure it I'm sure will come up again. Uh, two pieces of news that we need to hit on here. Uh, the first, which uh, Jason kind of gave us the the quick rundown of the other day, right when it happened. Although Donald and I were not able to log on, was the recent commitment of Jaden Shoot. I'm here to update that that we have learned since Thursday that his name is pronounced Shoot. Jason, we are not going to fault you for that. I think everyone was caught off guard by this commitment, so it's fine to also be caught off guard by the pronunciation. But Jaden Shoot is a is a four star guard in the 2022 class who has committed to Duke. He's going to be joining Kyle Filipowski next year, and so that is exciting. Um, we're going to talk about that, and then after the break, we need to get to unfortunately Duke's opening loss of the football season against Charlotte, the Charlotte 49ers. Uh, I was unaware until this week that Charlotte was the 49ers. We will, we'll talk about all of that. Let's come back to Jaden Shute's commitment. Jason, I'm going to let you start on this because first I want to let you have the chance to apologize for mispronouncing his name, but then also what more have we learned uh, since Thursday? So regarding his name, it never occurred to me that his name was Shute because I figured a kid who is a great shooter if his name was pronounced shoot, that there would be articles, there would be things that would mention it. And, and I just watched, about that. Yeah, I watched a bunch of highlights of him, but unfortunately in none of the highlights was there like an announcer saying anything. 
Um, so, so I figured it had to be shut. And I'm uh, Jaden. I'm if you're listening. First of all, what are you doing listening? But <laughs> I'm really sorry, man. I apologize. Shoot, it will be shoot from now on, and that's gonna be easy to remember because the dude is a great shooter. Hey, don't don't beat yourself up over this because in the 17 highlight videos I've watched of him since Thursday when he or, th- or was that, I believe it was Thursday when he committed, he I, like literally every single person's like, "My bad, dude. I thought your name was shut. It's shoot." Uh, but literally, they all start with. This guy's actual name is pronounced shoot and everyone is very, very caught off guard by this. So it's not your fault, Jason. I think everyone in the world was blindsided by this. All right, Donald, then we need, we need your initial take then on, on Jaden shoot incoming shooting guard for Duke for next year. Look, if anything, you know, I, I don't like to take highlight videos and expand on them and say, this is the greatest thing ever. We've talked about this in the past. But if he is like what people are talking about with regards to shooting, we just signed a killer. Like we just signed a guy who was going to be able to light it up from beyond the arc, stretch defenses beyond expectation. I, I don't want to compare to his shooting right now, but if he can, if he has the comparison to me of a JJ Redick with his range. And I think that is, you know, walk off the bus type of range where if you walk into any gym, you have to realize that your defense has to stretch beyond the 22 feet in 10 inches, whatever that the, that the three point arc is. You're going to have to guard him at any point on the floor because he can take it and shoot it. I think that's going to help out everybody else along the line, because if you're able to stretch out a defense, as we all know, that opens up a lot of holes for other people to exploit. And we're going to have some guys who can be able to, you know, drive in. We're going to have Kyle Filipowski and we're going to have a shooter who could bring everybody back out and make sure defenses have to guard them as soon as they cross half court, which means they're tired at the end of the game, which means that they have, that Duke will have the edge. And honestly, when people are comparing him to John Shire, it's no, it's no doubt that like John Shire looked and saw a lot of him in Jaden shoot. And that's why he's one of the new recruits. Yeah. I'm, I'm very excited about, about that comparison about him being a, a John Shire type, uh, as of now in the, in the recruiting rankings, I think, you know, going into the summer, he was like somewhere around a hundred, but he shot up a lot. I know Jason talked about that and, and how, how shoot is, is really climbing the board. And, and, and this commitment admittedly will probably help him uh, help raise his profile even more because guys committing to Duke is, uh, is, is just one great indicator for where their careers are headed. But um, again, going back to the the conversation we had with, with um, with Andy Borman about Kyle Filipowski and sort of his projectability as a Duke player, how he expects to be a, a multi-year player at Duke. I'm hoping that Jaden shoot is the same way because Duke has been able to be successful when they have these veteran players who do bring, you know, big time skill sets like, like big shooting the way that we expect Jaden shoot to. So uh, I'm excited about that. I'm excited about his ability to stretch the floor. Like Donald was talking about. I think that, one of the things that that has challenged Duke in recent years is that the guards have not been as good at shooting as they have on on previous Duke teams that have been more successful. So I'm looking forward to that element of the commitment. And this Duke recruiting class, all of a sudden, between Filipowski, I, I completely failed to uh, mention Tariq Whitehead again, and then now Jaden Shute is looking very strong with a few other guys who are on the horizon for John Shire. So uh, as we have said previously, when We've gotten other commitments here. Uh, don't expect the recruiting to drop off too dramatically under head coach John Shire. Uh, you know, the thing about Jaden, and Sam, you mentioned this notion of, oh, multi-year player versus one and done. I think there's little question that he's going to be a multi-year player. He, he just doesn't seem to have the kind of uh, athleticism um, and, and quickness. Not to say he's not quick, but he doesn't have the kind of, of physical gifts that the NBA is going to covet right away. Um, at, at least that's how it looks. And in fact, I mean, I'd temper expectations and say that I think it's fairly likely that at least one of either Wendell Moore or Trevor Keels, if not both of them, are back at Duke um, for another season after this upcoming year. Uh, look, I, you know, a lot of things you can't project about the coming season. I, I think it's fairly likely one of those guys is, is back. And, and I would think that either one of those guys, if they return to Duke, would um, would likely be starting uh, ahead of Jaden Shute. Um, what's more, uh, Duke, Duke is still recruiting perimeter players. Um, J.J. Starling is a kid that Duke is still recruiting, who, if they landed him, is higher regarded than Jaden Shute. Um, Starling is more of a combo guard, so he's probably seen as someone who could play point guard or shooting guard. But um, 
Uh, I, I don't even know that I project Jaden Shute to be a starter right away at Duke. In fact, I, I think it's fairly likely he won't be. That's not to say he's not going to be a great player and an impact player over the course of, of what I think will be probably a long career at Duke. Um, uh, and, and his shooting is going to be super valuable, like you guys said. I mean, Donald, Donald spoke about it. The ability to stretch the floor, the ability to have a guy that teams cannot help off of because the moment they help off of him, they're giving up three points as opposed to two points, is going to open up um, uh, spacing all over the floor for Duke. The modern NBA and college game is all about spacing. And, uh, and having a kid like this, who is arguably the best shooter in the class, means you're going to be nothing but good on the spacing standpoint. And in case you're worried about, about Jaden Shute's current 247 ranking that's not very high, I told you that, that it's rising, but just look at the kid's offer list. I mean, it wasn't just Duke that was after him in the high majors. Michigan State offered, Illinois offered, Florida offered. So uh, a lot of big time programs that were that were after this guy. So uh, I think Duke got a special one uh, here in Jaden Shoot. Donald, last word on on Jaden Shoot. Uh, anything else about his commitment or what you're looking forward to in in upcoming uh, commitment news for the Blue Devils? Yeah, well, it, uh, you're starting to see a class shape up for John Shire, right? We have the Greek Whitehead, we have Kyle Filipowski, and now we have Jaden Shute. You have this, you're starting to kind of see how he's going to recruit, and it's not going to be just going after, you know, a lot of the top guys in the class. Yeah, he'll go after those, but it seems like he's forming a class that's going to kind of play in a style that he wants to play, and so it's interesting to see that kind of shape out, and I'm looking forward to seeing these three guys in particular and any other guys that we get down the line how they progress during their senior year to see kind of what this Duke team is going to be like in the post K era. And, and the expectation is that Shire and Duke are aiming for a five or six person class. Um, uh, Duke is considered the leader for Mark Mitchell. Um, Duke is obviously very, very much in it for Derek Lively, who is arguably the number one player in the class. I mentioned JJ Starling, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of guys that, that Duke is still after and Duke is considered in very good shape for those players. And if you put, let's say it's those six guys, because that's what some people say could really happen. If you put those six guys together in a group, it, it, it kind of forms a, a, you know, like a starting five plus one sub. Shoot would probably be the sub there. But uh, it, it, it's a really interesting set of players who could be coming um, and, and forming the core of what Shire has in his first year, along with, in all likelihood, like I said, at least one or two, maybe even three guys returning from the current Duke team. And this will be the first step, right? We're also going to learn about how they deal with the transfer portal, which was, the, you know, incredible last year. It, it shouldn't be as, you know, thick this year. But this coming season, when he has his recruiting class, there'll be a little bit of a rotation. We'll have some seniors. We'll have some people depart. And then you'll have some people who come in via the transfer portal, possibly. It's going to be interesting to see how John Shire interacts with that as well, because that will help form some of his classes, too, down the line. Yeah, and the transfer portal, by the way, folks should understand. My understand, my belief is that you're only allowed one of these free transfers, which is what everybody did. So, uh, so you had you know more than a thousand players transfer schools this this off season. Um, those players cannot transfer again without sitting out a year. Uh, so, I think that you're going to see the transfer portal calm down a pretty good bit, but it's still going to be very, very active. I expect. All right, so that is it on the recruiting news. As Jason said, there are a handful of guys that Duke is still after. I think Derek Lively, chief among them, arguably the best player in the class. So uh, those commitments, as they as they draw near, we'll we'll bring them back up again to bring you up to speed on all of those players. But uh, now we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, <sighs> I guess we have to talk about the football game. We will be right back. Stay with us. <laughs> Gentlemen, it was a difficult Friday evening for Duke in Charlotte. Uh, this past weekend, Duke uh, visited the Charlotte 49ers and lost 31 to 28. It was a heartbreaking loss as Charlotte was able to drive down the field with just a couple minutes left in the game to uh, to, to take a touchdown uh, for the lead to, to finish off Duke. It was Charlotte's first win against a Power 5 program in program history. Uh, and it was my opportunity to learn that Charlotte are the 49ers 
a name that I really don't understand because Charlotte, nowhere near uh, where the gold rush happened, but that's okay. Uh, Duke needs to pick themselves up and, and dust themselves off and get ready for more games ahead. One highlight from this game that hopefully we will get to spend a couple minutes on is Mateo Durant, who we highlighted in the season preview episode with Jim Sumner and who Duke fans. And I think we were all excited to see uh, return for this season and see how he was going to do. He uh, had a monster night for the blue devils. So Jason, I'm going to start with you. Why don't we, why don't we do the highlights first and then we can get to the frustrating things so that at least we can get the positives out of the way. Yeah. Mateo Durant. Yeah. Uh, there you go. <laughs> my, I, I, in fact, uh, my perhaps my biggest criticism of this game is that Mateo Durant carried the ball 29 times. I wish it had been more like 35 times. <laughs> uh, more than half of Duke plays did not involve Mateo Durant getting the ball. What are we doing on those plays? <laughs> we need to get him the ball every single. I, I'm kidding, of course. Obviously, there is wear and tear, and you have to worry about those kind of things. But the the kid was absolutely uh, electric. He was ripping off big runs. He was grinding it out. Uh, I, I I like I said. I, I think Duke. Duke should have tried to get to him more if they could have. Uh, I also thought Jake Bobo had a pretty nice game receiving, uh, receiving wise. Um, I, you know, as as we've seen over the years recently, uh, the Duke receivers don't do a great job of getting open, and even sometimes when they are open, they they don't hold uh, hold on to the ball. Jake Bobo to me looked like the guy who was the uh, most reliable, at least in terms of holding on to the ball. So uh, I I didn't see a lot else that I loved on on defense. I thought uh, defensive end RJ Oban uh, looked like he got in the backfield, uh, uh, you know, rushing the quarterback, especially uh, a few times. And that was good. But but there are a few other highlights, in my opinion. Gunnar Holmberg, who's the guy that everybody was looking to and, and paying attention to. I mean, he had a nice day in terms of the number of passes he completed. But, I, uh, uh, you know, he, he only it was 20 of 29, which is a good percentage. But I, I still thought he he wasn't that accurate. Um, a number of those completions were, were like swing passes, you know, short passes where of course you're going to complete it. And, and the job of the quarterback is not to complete that pass. The job of the quarterback is to throw that pass. So the, so the guy who's receiving it can, can get it in, uh, in rhythm and, and start to really advance the ball fast. You're going to throw the ball a short distance. So the guy can run with it a long distance. And I thought Gunnar Holmberg, no offense, was terrible at that. Um, uh, there are a number of screen passes where he threw behind the receiver. So the guy would catch it, but wouldn't have any momentum. The defense is all coming toward him. And then Duke would sometimes lose yardage or only gain one or two yards. If you hit the guy in stride there, if he's got momentum going with him, then he's going to get five, seven, 10, 12 plus yards. And I thought Gunnar Holmberg was terrible at that. Um, we didn't throw the ball downfield very much. The few times that we did, uh, it, it didn't work out either because we dropped it or because the pass wasn't accurate. I, I don't know. Sam, I'm sorry. You asked me to say the good. I apologize. As soon as I mentioned Gunnar Holmberg, I got into the bad. And I vowed to myself that I, when you said, hey, Jason, give me the good. I was like, okay, wait, I'm going to, I'm going to wait. I'm not going to, I can't, I don't know how. And, and, like, and look, ugh. it's not, it's not your fault. Uh, it was terrible. That's a terrible game. Let's, let's be clear. Be excited about uh, the, <laughs> the bummer for me. The bummer for me on, on Gunnar Holmberg is that he is an experienced guy. Like he doesn't have that many snaps uh, under his belt, but he's got years in the program. And so you would think that there would be like just a little bit more sort of general maturity to his game, despite the lack of playing time, just because he's been around other good quarterbacks and, and he's gotten to learn under coach Cutcliffe and the, and the offensive system at Duke. And, and it, and it hasn't, it hasn't showed yet. So um, there are plenty more games for, for things to recover. And by the way, Duke is not the only team in, in the ACC that, that looked a little lost uh, this weekend on the football field. Donald, what were your impressions of the, of the Duke game? And then maybe if we want to touch on, on the rest of the ACC, just briefly, we can do that after. Yeah. So really when it goes back to Durant, I thought he had a better game than Jason just advertised. And that's hard to say because Jason, just lit up the world about Mateo Durant. The fact is he had 8.8 .8 yards per rush. Think about that. The, the guy who has the most rushing at the biggest rushing average in the history of the NFL is like 5.7. Like he literally was averaging almost a first down every time he touched the ball. And then when he caught the ball, he was going for 16 and a half yards. So every time Mateo Durant touched the ball, he made something happen. I think 
that was what we talked about in the preview with Jim Sumner. I'm glad we were right on that. I like being right on things like that. So Taylor Durant had a really great game. One guy I, I thought that you overlooked a little bit was Jordan Waters. And Jordan Waters, I thought, had a pretty decent game. He only had two catches for 40 yards, but he also had five rushes for 65 yards. And that was just another way for the offense to keep moving down the field. And I think when it comes to this offense, I thought from the highlights, I thought we saw a lot of stagnation that we are used to seeing. And we were told that that was not going to happen. Um, and so that was kind of the disappointing thing is that we had a little bit of stagnation. And because of that, we, you know, Charlotte was able to stay in the game and, main, and be able to focus on getting the win. Mateo Durant runs off a 53-yard touchdown with a minute 44. That should, that should have broken every back in the 49ers stadium, whatever they call it. I'm sorry, Jerry Richardson Stadium. They should have broken every back that was in that building, and they should have never recovered from that. But they were able to because, for some reason, it was always instilled in that confidence that Charlotte had that they could come back and have enough time to win the game. And even when they took the lead with 30 seconds left, we still have a Taylor Durant. The whole building should have been like, well, this guy's getting the ball, and we weren't able to make anything happen. So that is that is the disappointment there. Uh, but I do think there was a couple of people who could – uh, who, who we have saw a lot of promise from. I will say the one thing, Jason, that we talked about a lot last year was turnovers. We didn't have any interceptions, but we had two fumbles that were recovered by, by Charlotte. Again, that is two more possessions that we could have gone a long way, especially when you had someone as hot as Mateo Durant working for you. Well, well wait a second. One of those possessions, one of those fumbles, we couldn't go a long way because we were on the one yard line. Uh, right. I, I, oh my <laughs> God. I, I mean, for us, Duke had almost talk about missed opportunities. Uh, Duke had almost 600 yards of offense and only scored 28 points. Uh, and when you think about the fact that um, a lot of those points were Mateo Durant ripping off 50 plus yard runs, you're like, how how did Duke only get 28 points in a game like this? It was incredibly frustrating. You know, we had the the QB fumble. Uh, on essentially the one yard line, zero points from that possession. Jalen Calhoun dropped a perfectly thrown deep pass. He was wide open. There was literally no one within five yards of him. It it hit him perfectly in stride, um, which which was a rarity for the vertically challenged Gunnar Holmberg. Um, and uh, it it literally hits him in the numbers and just goes right through his arms. I, I don't know how. That's seven more points off the board. Uh, the easily fourteen Duke fourteen more points with ease they they should have had in this game. I, I, the defense was the number of missed tackles was just unbelievable. It's, it's like these guys have been practicing, like not in pads, like, Oh, let's not hit each other too hard. So this, so they forgot how to tackle in practice or something like that, because there were a number of times we had guys for, uh, for, for uh, Charlotte who were bottled up and they would, you know, shimmy a little bit or, or run a little bit. And, and suddenly like the Duke guys were bouncing off of them guys were going between our arms it was it was terrible and and, and I don't want to I don't want to go without talking about what I thought was some terrible coaching I thought some some really poor play call um on defense on the game winning touchdown Duke Duke sells out and goes in an all out blitz uh Charlotte was on like the 12 yard line or something like that they were you know it, clearly in uh you know scoring range they have a very um fast quarterback who's shown he has an ability to move around a lot. He's in the shotgun and, and you all out blitz him. I mean, of course he had an easy time finding his release valve, the running back wide open in the flat. And the guy then waltzed into the end zone, you know, with almost no resistance at all. Why are you going in an all out blitz in that spot? It's just, it, it, you have to know what the opposition is going to be good at. I, I, there's no way Duke's going to reach the quarterback in a situation like that. A fast quarterback already in the shotgun. At, at that spot in the field. And even if you sack him, it doesn't do that much. There was enough time on the clock that Charlotte was going to be able to run more plays. I, I, I don't, I don't even begin to understand the defensive play call there. And then there were some offensive play calls. Duke had a third and 15 from their 38. You know, when we were close to field goal range uh, with about five minutes left and we were up, we were up four points and it would have been a key moment to you know, the defense doesn't want you to get 15 yards there. But it's a key moment where you can probably throw the ball for seven or eight and get yourself in field goal range and give yourself a shot at, at a field goal to go up seven. And instead, we ran it up the middle and we got like two yards and then punted it. 
I, I, I don't know. They, they, that, those are just a couple examples. I just thought the play calling was, was atrocious. And uh, David Cutcliffe, you can't lose to Charlotte. Uh, let's be clear. It'll take a miracle for Duke to get to six wins now. It's very hard. I, I don't think this team goes bowling now. I, and in fact, based on what I saw, I think this is probably like, I don't know, maybe a two win team. I mean, we play NC A and T this year, this week. They're awful. They're terrible. They're, um, they're not in a class with a power five conference team like Duke, but I, I would have said something at least somewhat similar about Charlotte guys. Do you, do you guys know I'm, I'm placed a wager on this game on the Charlotte game? Why would you do that? NC A and T game, the Charlotte game. So, so the line was six and a half. Duke won by 25 last year. And, and I really thought from what I'd heard from the preseason camp that Duke had improved over last season, uh, uh, you know, especially on offense. Um, I thought that Gunnar Holmberg would be better than Chase Bryce. And so I'm like, hey, we won by 25 a year ago. Uh, so I placed a wager. I, I wage, I, I don't usually bet on college football. I, it's very rare. I wagered $500. <laughs> Jason. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yes. Stop, stop, stop. Yes. You, you wagered, you did not consult your attorney and you're <laughs> consulting down here on that because I would have told you the Cardinal rule, as you know, never bet on your team because they will always leave you disappointed, win or lose. Like, Particularly fine. like a large sum of money. You know? 500? <laughs> That's yeah, not so, I, <clears throat> so uh, my theory was this. Um, my son, I'm going to be going out to play in some tournaments at the World Series of Poker in a, in a couple, uh, in a few weeks during October. And uh, my son is going to come with me. One of the tournaments I'm entering is, is a $500 entry. It's a, it's a very low buy-in tournament. And uh, I was figuring I was going to win 500 bucks on Duke. And that was going to allow me to pay for my son to also enter the tournament. <laughs> now, now none of you are going. It didn't work out. <laughs> now none of you are going. <laughs> No, I'm still going. I'm still going. Jason, you guys I'm, are speechless. I'm, you don't even know what I'm, to say. I'm, about yeah, yeah. I'm beside myself. I didn't. I didn't realize you had done this. Uh, and and I agree with Donald that we would have advised against it uh, on Duke football. Year. Yeah. Well, and, and like <laughs> and like in a year, we, we when we did the the preview with Jim Summer, it was like I think you you know the 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 conversation was good, and Jim has a lot of has a lot of uh, interesting things to say about the team. But I think you could have summed up the whole conversation as, boy, I don't know about that. Like that's the whole, that was the whole vibe on the team this year. So, yep. so throwing $500 the vibe, on man. the team to, to cover the spread in their first game, regardless of the opponent, regardless of the spread, just seemed, uh, just seemed very bold very quickly on the rest of the ACC. Donald. Well, wait, 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 to, I, 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 just wanna, what? I just want to, I just want to say, what do you want to defend yourself? No, no, I'm not going to defend myself. <laughs> this is the, I want to say this is the first time in my life I've ever bet on Duke football. I've bet on Duke basketball many times. Um, Damn, you uh, really jumped into it, didn't you? <laughs> I really did, yeah. And and this is an unusually large wager for me. I'm I'm usually more in the hundred, maybe two hundred dollar range at the most, and I don't bet all that often. Uh, but I I wish the audience out there could have seen the two of your faces when I said it was a five hundred dollar bet. Both of you, I can't describe it other than stunned into silence. <laughs> I thought I, I, I thought it. you were gonna say like I thought you were gonna say like you know fifty or something with fifties. I'm like okay, that's twenty dollar mm -hmm. bet. Cool. You like I'm gonna throw some duckers at my team, throw my support. Fuck. <laughs> I don't like any of my team's five hundred dollars enough. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, Jason Evans is a homeowner, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, a, that's another level. I need to level up. I uh, I'm I'm not much of a sports gambler. I, I'm sure we've talked about this before. I'm not much of a gambler in general, although I've you know I've played like table games and stuff, but I really don't don't do that much uh, gambling on sports. So I generally just stay away from the whole conversation. But man, that feels like a lot to me. <laughs> I, I want to say. That with a five, with a five hundred dollar wager and a six and a half point spread, um, there were a number of times late in the game where I was sort of doing, you know, some crazy arithmetic, like, okay, Duke's up four here. Uh, do I need we, to? Yeah, do, do I, I need to hedge? And I, I was like, no, I was like, I was like, we got to kick this field goal. We got to kick this field goal to go up seven. And then, uh, and then, um, when Charlotte was driving down, 
my son said to me, he's like, you know, if they score a touchdown here and take the lead, Duke can come down, kick a field goal. And then in overtime, Duke could win by seven. And I was like, yeah, let's see. Duke has to get the ball first. They have to score a touchdown. And then, cause if they score it, cause in overtime, if they, if they go second, you never win by seven, the most you could win by is six. I'm like, okay. And I was doing all the, all the math. you like, you root for did some weird things. Did everybody <laughs> follow this? Did everybody follow this whole line of thinking? Just be careful when you, when you jump head first into sports gambling. Uh, speaking of, of, of the lines and and the ACC, Donald, would you like to apologize for Miami not covering the spread against uh, against Alabama? It was Alabama. What did you expect? I mean, <laughs> we did a whole live broadcast. We did a whole live podcast two years ago from the Mercedes Benz Stadium parking lot where we discussed how yeah when we do play Alabama, we're like, oh yeah, we had the, we we covered the spread for the first quarter. Miami didn't even do that. So <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's that's what it is. Miami, look, Miami is a machine. We know this, and uh, I had Al- to kind of Alabama. Alabama is a machine, I think, is what you meant to say. Yeah, you, you, yes, said, Miami. you said Miami. I said Bama. Miami. Yeah, I said Bama. Yeah, Bama is a machine, and <laughs> they like. I had some of my friends who were talking the same way you were, you were talking, Jason. Like, yo, it's only plus seven. We should bet on, on Miami. I was like, guys, put your money in your pocket, save it, buy buy some alcohol or something because you're gonna need it. Sure the enough, during that plus, game, the line was plus seven. Miami was no, only a seven no, no, point no. dog. No, no. <clears throat> No, there, it was when it opened like two weeks ago. This was like, I've been trying okay. to talk them off the ledge for like two weeks because every single time they looked at us like, now it's 13, now it's 14, now it's 12. Like, <laughs> I was like, guys, they're trying to tell you something. Put your money in your pocket. And some of my friends didn't. So and sure Jason, enough, they lost by like 30 points. So there you yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. So it is what it is, man. Like Bama's machine. And I don't know if anyone's going to stop them this year. And I had hope for about 35 seconds into the game and then Bama scored. Wait, hang on. I think they just scored again. So Jason, Jason, do you want to uh, revel for a second in, in UNC losing in their first game as a, as a top 10 team of the season? Yeah, there were a number of interesting results this weekend in the ACC Virginia tech taking it to Carolina um, was, was one of the more interesting ones. Sam Howell, who many folks had touted as a, uh, not even a dark horse, but like, you know, one of the guys who was really in the Heisman running three interceptions in his first game, not, not a good way to start the season for the Tar Heels. And uh, don't I, get I, excited. I, don't get excited. that Duke is going to like beat Carolina this year in football, by the way, yeah, don't, don't, no. don't catch us saying that, but at the very least. Right. Right. I, I, I think that the, uh, the national excitement over UNC as a top 10 team may have been just a tiny bit overblown. You know, the other results that I thought were really interesting Florida State um, really hung, really hung with Notre Dame. That game goes to overtime. And in fact, in overtime, the difference was the FSU kicker missed a 37-yard field goal and the Notre Dame kicker hit a 41-yard field goal. I mean, uh, you know, the vagaries of kicking are the only reason that Notre Dame beat Florida State. That would have been a big win for the ACC and for Florida State, you know, getting things started with, uh, with, you know, with that program trying to get back to where they were um, you know, several years ago when Florida State was a, a major national power. And then I got to talk about that Georgia Clemson game. Um, really exciting game. Unbelievable defenses. I, I am dying to see that Georgia defense play the Alabama offense, which I think will happen in the SEC championship game. Um, that looks like, you know, unstoppable force against immovable object kind of thing. But, um, for, you know, for, for Georgia to have completely stymied Clemson, I, I, I really wonder now, Clemson could run the table from here and not make the playoffs because they don't have, there are no other sort of good teams for them to play. I mean, I guess North Carolina in the ACC championship game would sort of be the best they could hope. If Carolina had, if Carolina lived up to the top 10 ranking, that's what Clemson was hoping for as a way to get into the championship. If, if, if no ACC team steps up and shows themselves to be a top 10, top 15 team, I don't know that Clemson makes it even if they run the table because they, they won't have beaten anyone. Uh, going back to that Virginia Tech uh, UNC game for a second, I'm I'm of the opinion, and some people can disagree with me. I'm of the opinion that the Inter Sandman intro that they do at all games at at uh, in Blacksburg is a little bit overrated. Except when it's the opening weekend of college football, that interest that they did would have beaten anybody. They would have blown everybody out of the gym. They were hyped for that game. And I think that's kind of where you kind of get the, the, the you know, the spider senses and your, and your the, the goosebumps on your skin. That's what college football is about, right? Like the intro, the, 
the intro to college football, the opening weekend, I mean, I know they had week zero. We won't count that. But this is, for all intents and purposes, the opening week. And to have that sort of atmosphere back in the midst of just there's it all outside, right, That this climate that we're in, it's really something special to see. And it's something that I think all of us are like, we wish we could have that uh, for Duke football and for, you know, and for me, for Miami, just to have that feeling of, you know, a new season, a new beginning, we're going to do something and for it to fall flat. That's where the frustration kind of lies with some of my teams. And, and by the way, among all that excitement, I think there was a lot of reporting about the, the level of vaccination status at, at all these schools that were having, uh, that were having games. Uh, Virginia Tech, I think I read that, that the, the student body are all vaccinated and that they, they disenrolled students who, who hadn't submitted their vaccination reports yet. So um, at least some of my, I, I'd say that I'm uh, generally cautious about, about activities during pandemic. And, and it was at least good to see some of that reporting about, about the student bodies being vaccinated. I don't know so much about the, the general public that was attending some of these games, but, um, but we continue to hope that, that there will be less spread of the coronavirus this week than there was last week. Jason, any final thoughts on the ACC football uh, or NCAA football uh, headed into week two? Uh, yeah, for, for all of us, Sam alluded to this, but I wanted to put a finer point on it. For all of us who were frustrated, disappointed, upset that Duke lost to Charlotte, uh, at least we didn't lose at home to Northern Illinois. Georgia Tech uh, lost at home to Northern Illinois. Uh, that's tough. The directional schools. You don't like to lose to the directional schools. So that will do it for this episode of the Duke Basketball Report podcast for Jason Evans and Donald Wine and for our very, very sad football team. I am Sam Klein. We will be back very soon with a, with a fun uh, special edition episode that will be coming at you that is not uh, about any of, the, any of the topical news. We'll be doing a fun draft, so check out that coming soon in your feeds. But until then, uh, so long, take care, go Duke, and Duke Band, take us home. What are you laughing about? Duke band, take us home. That's what we do every time. <laughs> we do that every time. That's hey, wait, quite literally. No, no, we don't happened. do that. Don't tell her that. Don't tell her that. We don't do that. That's not us. <laughs> That's your time. Right. We don't do that. Yes, you want the bad news? We're recording another episode. Right now? Yeah. <laughs> Why? Because we have to. And we're together. It's easy. Hey. Hey.